I'm Brian Hill, and once again, we are talking about writing. So this video is going to be about story structure. It's a, a basic overview of three-act structure and also five-act structure and how they're kind of the same thing. Now, this is kind of an amalgam of a couple of thought processes, uh, like five-act Elizabethan structure, traditional three-act structure, the work of Joseph Campbell, and the interpretation of that work by Christopher Vogler. In the uh, video notes, I'll put links to, well, if I, I don't know if I can link or not, but I will put uh, the titles of some books that I think are useful to read after this video so you can explore story structure for yourself. Before I get into the nitty-gritty of this, just a word about structure. I don't believe that story structure is something that uh, was created and then put on top of stories. I think that story structure lives innately inside of us. You know, we are born, we, we struggle to grow, we gain power, we become adults, we hopefully use that power in the world for the common good, and we suffer our defeats, and eventually we meet death, and we hopefully have a, a life well worth, you know, living, you know, a life that has served more than it's taken. It's part of being a human being, really, this idea of narrative structure. You know, stories began with people talking around campfires. You know, everything began with an oral tradition, even works like, you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey. This was all stuff that was spoken before it was ever written down and read by people. And the purpose of stories have always been to help us deal with the mysteries and the vagaries of, of life. It's always about who and what we are. So story structure isn't something that I think people created as much as I think it's something people discovered. So emotionally, you already know story structure. What follows here will be a kind of a mapping out of your instinct, essentially. So that now your instinct and your intellect can work in concert to help you tell stories. So the first story structure we're going to deal with here is traditional three-act structure. And I'll scroll down as I start going, going down this. Um, so three-act structure is beginning, middle, and end, right? Every story has a beginning, and then it has a middle, and then it has an end. Right? We all know that. So we're already halfway to the goal. Because if you know to do your beginning, middle, end, then you have a sense of story structure. Now, of course, you can put the middle and the beginning and the end and where the middle is. You can do all crazy stuff with it if you want. But this is the kind of 101 approach to story structure. And then you can find out you know, how you want to do it uh, as you start telling stories. So let's just go ahead and get into it here. So act one. Uh, the first act of your story uh, is there to establish the world and the protagonist. Uh, meaning, where are we? What is happening in this place? What time are we in? What's the situation we're dealing with? And who is our protagonist or group of protagonists? Who are we going to follow in the story? So this is when you want to establish all that stuff. This is the foundation of, of the building. You've excavated the the hole, and now you got to pour the concrete in. You have to build your story on top of something. You're giving the audience the rules of the world. You know, think to Star Wars, and uh, we know that there's an empire. They're bad. We know there's a rebellion. They're good. We know there's someone scary named Darth Vader who's looking for some plans, and then the droids, they go to Tatooine where we meet Luke Skywalker and Owen and Beru, and that's the 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 you know, the skeletal work of the first act. Yeah, so that's the job of the first act. You want to establish your world and your protagonist there. You can pace yourself a little bit in act one. You, you don't have to fly through act one. Now, you want an efficient act one. 
You don't want it to go on too far, but this is a time to wade the audience into the narrative. Uh, Call to Adventure is, you know, it's a Campbellian term. If you study Joseph Campbell, uh, you read A Hero with a Thousand Faces or The Mass of God, or you, you listen to the Bill Moyers conversations, all of which I recommend, the Call to Adventure is the moment where the protagonist or group of protagonists gets offered the opportunity to go on the adventure. So going back to Luke Skywalker, that's when Ben Kenobi rescues Luke from the Sand People. He's in the little little hut thing. You know, because the story about Darth Vader and the pupil and Anakin Skywalker and the result of that story is, you know, you should come with me and become a Jedi. You know, train with me, go with me. That's the call to adventure. And we've always had those calls in, in our personal lives. Um, this video, in a way, is a call to adventure. It's me saying, hey, you should write stories. Here's some story structure. You know, break out Microsoft Word or break out a pad and, and a pencil and go ahead and start writing, right? It's a call to adventure. The next part is the kind of the other bookend to the call to adventure. It's the refusal of the call. So the refusal of the call is usually a victory of pragmatism over ambition. I want to be a Jedi, but I can't leave my farm. I I can't go. I have all these pragmatic reasons why I can't do this. And so that is very real. I mean, we feel that. You know, I had to leave St. Louis to go to New York to get an education so I could be a storyteller. And I had doubts about whether or not that would work. When I wrote my first screenplay, I had doubts about whether or not I was any good at this. You know, when I graduated from NYU and didn't have a job and had all this debt, I had doubts about this adventure I was going to take myself on. And the refusal of the call is usually when uh, the protagonist says, I would like to go with you. I, I want to take that ring and destroy it but I can't for all of these pragmatic reasons. And we start to uh, identify with a protagonist that goes through these things. We've established our world. We've established our protagonist. We get the call to adventure to the protagonist, but the hero says, oh, I don't know if I can do it. Uh, you know, I got to stay here and, and moisture farm. I, I, can't, I can't go with you, Ben. I want to, but I can't. So the act one climax, right, the the climax to the first act of your story is the acceptance of the call. And that's when the hero, despite all the pragmatic reasons, decides, I have to go on this adventure. In Luke's case, his aunt and uncle got turned into barbecue by the stormtroopers, so he didn't really have many pragmatic reasons left not to go. But it still functioned as a climax because it was a traumatic experience that left an imprint upon Luke Skywalker. The acceptance of the call doesn't have to stem from tragedy. It can just be a decision that a person makes. You know, it can be someone says, hey, you should go do that fighting game tournament that you want to do. And oh, I can't do that. I got to stay here. I got to do this other thing. I got shifts. I got to work at work. I can't worry about that. And you bump into a, a guy that you know lives on your floor, and it's an older guy, a wiser guy. Sometimes the mentor is the character that helps the hero accept the call. But I'll get into archetypes in another video. But you know that that guy says, "Oh, I remember when I was your age, and I had an opportunity to do a music festival, and I didn't do it, and I've regretted it ever since. And I think you should go ahead and and do the fighting game tournament." So the hero accepts the call. Right. And that becomes the act one climax. It's the moment the hero decides to go on this adventure. They're going to leave their ordinary world behind and they're going to set off, you know, pack their bag and hop in their 65 Camaro and drive wherever they got to go. This is the point when the hero is taking off from the runway of their normal world into the unknown skies of the adventure. And that's the climax to the first act, which will now lead you into the second act. So act two, uh, the true adventure begins. So in the second act of your story, uh, now we are in parts unknown, right? 
you know, now we are meeting Han Solo and Chewbacca. We're going to Moss Eisley. We're, we're dealing with all of these new things that are challenging us in ways that we could expect and also in ways that we couldn't expect. Now, Act 2 can be a mess for most new writers because it's a big act. You know, Act 1 of a screenplay is around 25 or so pages. Act 2 of a screenplay is around 50 pages. And you can get sort of lost in that. That's why the the end of this video, I'm going to talk about uh, five-act structure and how that can help. But for right now, Act 2 is when the true adventure begins. When the hero is is moving through the, the dark forest and they have to deal with all of the things that lie within the forest, which are usually symbolic of the things that lie inside of the hero, right? We're always sort of fighting ourselves in a mythological quest. Uh, introduce new characters, test allies and enemies. So usually in Act 2, the hero will, you know, have a couple of adventures, uh, uh, a couple of action sequences, you know. Things will happen, they'll have to overcome, and, the, you know, get a taste of, of physical conflict or emotional conflict or intellectual conflict, whatever it is. If it's a legal thriller... In Act 1, Hero says, I'm going to take the case. In Act 2, you have depositions, or you have to get a motion passed to get the evidence. You know, it, all that legal stuff is starting to happen, and things are getting um, not more complex, but the stakes, the consequence is getting raised. Allies and enemies. You're going to meet new characters. You know, um, following this legal thriller example, that's when, you know, you're, you're up to your neck in, in legal briefs, you don't know how you're going to put this case together. you got a small law firm. You are way over your head. Oh, but knocking on the door, here comes a, a genius paralegal who heard that you were taking this case and wanted to help you take out the corporate big bad, and they have just the thing you needed to help in your research and your case building. So that's an ally. That's good. Friendship is made. However, you find out that the defense attorney for the evil corporation that's poisoning the water with lead has never lost a case. You know, some veteran actor is playing this character and, you know, they've never lost a case against little lawyers like, like the hero and now this enemy has shown up that you're going to have to deal with. All of this stuff happens in the space of Act 2. So the Act 2 climax, uh, I say it's the Empire Strikes Back. What I mean by that is... The end of Act 2 is usually the darkest moment of the story. That's when things just went wrong. So let's say in this legal thriller example we're talking about, you found a star witness in the beginning of Act 2, and you were working with the genius paralegal on how to brief the star witness, and everything was great, and you know you're going to bring this witness into the courtroom, and they're going to tell their harrowing story about the poisoned water, and the jurors are going to cry, and you can actually win this thing. You even see some fear on the other side, that veteran uh, defense attorney that's never lost a case. The moment, the moment they found out you were calling this witness, you know, the, the sweat started to form on the forehead. You, you might be able to win this thing, but then you find out the witness isn't going to testify. You know, maybe the evil corporation bribed them, or maybe they were threatened, or if it's like a David Fincher film, maybe they're found dead or something. The point of it is, you no longer have that witness, and your entire case is falling apart, because you had built everything on that case. It's the lowest point of the narrative. The Act 2 climax is the defeat. It's the grand defeat uh, of the, the hero. So that's where you want to put all of that emotion and feeling and energy into your story is at the end of Act 2. And a screenplay uh, would be around page 80, page 75, page 80, depends how long your script is, but that's what, that's what happens in the, uh, the Act 2 climax. Then you get into Act 3. So Act 3 is when you rebuild from that defeat. Right? You've, you've lost everything, you don't have a case, you're, you're getting ready to, you know, turn it all in. You're going you're gonna to tell the, the person that you're, you're litigating for, we, we can't win this. You know, maybe we can cut a deal with the other side. Maybe you can take the money. I'm sorry, I failed you. I thought I could do this. Tears all around. But an idea forms uh, somewhere. 
maybe the witness who no longer wants to testify, there's a, a nugget of information that they, they gave the protagonist. And now, now that, that protagonist can chase that information down and go to the small town and instead of finding this one witness, maybe they can convince with a, a impassioned speech about how we all share in the effort of justice, they can get more people to, to testify. I mean, maybe, maybe someone that works for the corporation sees what's going on and, and the, the weight of conscience has, has snapped them in two and, and they walk in the door and say, if you, can, if you can get me on the stand, I'll testify because this is all wrong. You start to rebuild from that defeat. Uh, in Westerns, the beginning of Act 3 tends to be where the fireside chat is. I put that in quotes, the quote-unquote fireside chat. And that's, you know, when the outlaw and the group of outlaws, they get together around the fire and tell their stories, and they solidify their, their feeling as a brotherhood before they're going to go and take out the black hats that are they're taking over the town. You know, it, it's, a, it's a place to give back to the audience the hope that they lost in the Act Two climax. It's, it's a place to reignite those emotions that, that told you you could win, you, you, you could defeat the bad guy. Um, you know, in Star Wars, the uh, second Act climax is largely regarded as like the trash compactor uh, sequence up until the death of uh, Ben Kenobi. Spoilers, if you haven't seen uh, Star Wars. Um, that is generally regarded as like the end of the second act uh, stuff. And then, you know, in Act 3, it's meeting with the Rebellion and, you know, Luke deciding that, well, he can make that shot because uh, he used to, you know, make that shot back home. You know, it's the Rebellion itself rebuilding, getting ready to face the, uh, the Death Star. Um, it's funny, you know, Star Wars doesn't have the most... Well, I guess, you know, at the time... The death of Ben Kenobi was probably pretty emotional. It's been such a long time since I saw it. I mean, 1977, and I didn't even see it theatrically. I saw it uh, later. I was born, you know, in 77, so I didn't see it in a theater. Uh, but, you know, it is there, and and the, the rebuild is there. And so face the enemy for the last time after the, the heroes have gotten their mojo back. Um, and usually it's even a better mojo, a more pure mojo, like going back to our legal thriller, Maybe even when the protagonist had that star witness and they were going to try that case, their heart wasn't quite in the right place. Maybe the, the press attention was getting to them. Maybe they were thinking about their book deal. Maybe they weren't focused on the good they could do from the case because they got seduced into what winning the case could give them. But after everything was taken away from them, they can't pay the rent in the legal office and, you know, the, the Gene Hackman evil corporate defense attorney is, is mocking them for being a rube in some brilliantly written monologue. After all of that, they realize, well, they got into law not to make money. They got into law to help justice be served. So they've rediscovered that uh, critical part of their, of their philosophy that they're going to carry into the battle. And so they got their mojo back, but it, they got more than that. You know, they, they got the scars now. The wound has turned into a scar and the scar tissue is stronger than the tissue that was there before, right? So now they're going to face the enemy for the last time. Uh, and that leads us to the Act 3 climax, which is usually the enemy is defeated. You know, the, the closing arguments uh, are, are made, the, the protagonist wins the court case, the Death Star blows up, uh, Brody's able to kill the shark, uh, all that's that's a Jaws reference, all... All that stuff gets uh, resolved in the Act 3 climax. And I put a question mark there, because in a tragedy, the enemy usually isn't defeated. Usually in a tragedy, the enemy wins. Um, and that's a little bit of a trickier thing. I'll probably do another video about tragedies, rather than make this one too complex. But uh, the Act 3 climax, in a mythological, heroic narrative, is... Uh, usually the defeat of the bad guy. The dragon is defeated uh, in some way. And so that is basically three-act structure, right? You've got act one, establish the world, call to adventure, refuse the call, act two, climax, accept the call, act two, the true, uh, act one, I'm sorry, act one, climax, accept the call, 
Act 2, Adventure Begins, Introduce New Characters, Act 2, Climax, The Empire Strikes Back, The Darkest Moment, Act 3, uh, Rebuild from Defeat, Face the Enemy for the Last Time, we're going to go ahead and do it, we're going we're to take out the dragon, Act 3, Climax, we take out the dragon. So that's basically three-act structure, right? So now we're all feeling pretty good about understanding three-act structure, except we got this real messy part of it. We got all of this here. We got this act two, right? It looks simple on paper, but this is the this is the forest. This is this is the crazy part of the story. This is when stories can get way off track because you know sometimes we know what our climax is. We we have a sense of what the first act should be, but this right here, this is where it can get real real messy. And that's why thinking about three act structure as five act structure can actually help us out. So let's we'll scroll down here and look at this sort of revised version. So what I what I have here is three act structure, but I'm also kind of showing you how it's also five act structure, how you can layer five acts on top of three acts and it will help uh, clarify your second act. So five act structure same thing, right? Act 1, same deal, same points we went over before. Act 1 climax same thing went over before. Act two is where it starts to get a little interesting. So act two, right, we begin that. Um, and you know what? I'm going to call this act two A. And then uh, I will also call this or act two B. Uh, and I'll explain why I just did that right now, in fact. So, as I said before, in a screenplay, your second act is probably the biggest act of your script. If you have a 100-page script, you'll have 25 pages for the first act, you'll have 25 pages for the third act, and then you'll have 50 pages for the middle. The middle tends to be where all the red meat is in your narrative. That's why it can get difficult to figure out what to do in the middle, because you have all these pages to fill. And you know what your ending is, and you know what your beginning is, but you don't quite know how to get there. And then people start sort of shoving things into the narrative that don't need to be in there, and uh, they're just trying to fill the pages a little bit, and it gets kind of messy. Well, one way to cure the messiness, because I'm not going to present you a problem without presenting you a solution, because then I would be a bad YouTube person. So a solution to the mess of the second act is to think about what's called a midpoint. Now, excuse me. What is a midpoint? Well, uh, a midpoint is a moment in the story that changes the dynamic of the narrative in some major way. Uh, and the way I think about it is, up until the midpoint, we've established the known knowns. There are things about the story that we know to be true that the audience, the reader, knows to be true. And they're building their understanding of your world according to these uh, known knowns. Oftentimes, the midpoint turns the known knowns upside down. So let's take our legal thriller, for instance. So we meet our cool paralegal genius that's helping out with the case in the beginning of Act 2. Uh, a relationship starts to form between you know, uh, this person and the protagonist, you know, one, one, you know, they could be both women, they're both men, one's a woman, one's a man, whatever. We have a little love story maybe starting to form between the two, and it's kind of all good. Well, the midpoint, you could discover that this paralegal, well, they, they actually kind of work for the bad corporation, right? They're kind of a spy, uh, and they were sent by the evil Gene Hackman attorney uh, to the protagonist to convince the protagonist to go down the wrong path, right? Maybe they're the one that builds the whole case on the witness that's going to fall apart, right? A pretty big betrayal. So you might have a scene in the middle where we see the paralegal leave the office of the protagonist and they 
They, you know, they walk down the street, they turn a corner, go to a coffee shop, and, oh, Gene Hackman's there. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. Then they sit down, and Gene Hackman's like, you know, did you, did you do the thing? And they're like, yeah, I did the thing. They bought a hook, line, and sinker, and Gene Hackman, you know, is rubbing his hands together. Okay, good. You know, here's your puffy envelope full of money, whatever. Now we've turned upside down the, the dynamics of the story. The known known was the paralegal was a good guy, but now the paralegal is a bad guy. And that's what a good midpoint can do. It can change the, the fundamentals of the narrative. And by changing those fundamentals, it breathes new life into your story. Because if the, if the second act has the dynamic of, of the first act, and, and it just goes all the way through, it gets kind of boring. You know, okay, so the bad guys are bad, and the good guys are good, and they're trying to fight the bad guys, and oh, I got to get up and go get some popcorn. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm not that interested in this movie anymore. Or I can put this book down now, because I kind of feel like I know where this is going to go. Either they're going to win the case or not, and they probably will, and I don't want to read this. I'm going to go read something else. A good midpoint will uh, kind of inject a second wind into your narrative because it raises the stakes. You know, the, the dynamic is different now. Will the protagonist find out who the paralegal is in time? Uh, is the paralegal all bad or, or are they good? You know, what, what's really going on here? Is the love between the protagonist and the paralegal even real? Because it, it was an act. Is it all an act? All of that can uh, land on your midpoint. And now you've reinvested uh, people into your narrative. Usually after the midpoint, things start to go bad, right? Like the dynamic changes, things fall apart. The midpoint changes the dynamic of the story. It changes the flow of the story. And from that midpoint to the end of the second act, things are going wrong. So a really simple way to think about this is in the first half of act two, Things are going fairly well. I mean, there's some battles to be fought, but those battles are won. Then the midpoint happens, changes the dynamic, and things start to go bad, and they lead into the Act 2 climax, which is the darkest point of your narrative. So you see here I have or Act 3, right? So you can look at this like Act 1, Act 2 is pre-midpoint. Then you have your midpoint. And then act three is post the midpoint. So instead of having two acts, act one and act two, you have three. You have act one, act two, midpoint, act three, right? So you see all the, the five-act structure layers on top of that three-act structure. And now you're starting to get some bones inside of the second act. You know a little bit more about what to do. Because in addition to you know, beginning the adventure and introducing new characters, what you're really doing is setting up the midpoint. You know, when you bring in that paralegal and you're sparking that romance and, um, you know, the comedy that comes out of that and the hope that comes out of that, you're really setting the audience up for that midpoint moment when we find out the paralegal might be really bad. You know, you've done that. You've led them there. And that's uh, the function of a great midpoint. And then post the midpoint, you know, things go bad, leading to the uh, second act climax here, where the Empire strikes back. So, Act Three is usually uh, things just rolling downhill. You know, a bunch of things going wrong. You know, the simple way to think about it is Act Two, things are going pretty good. Midpoint, oh no, it's all bad. It's all bad. We're going to lose, right? And that's a, another way to think about it. Split that second act up into two acts uh, on either side of the midpoint. And now, instead of this big 50-page chunk that you don't really know what to do with after you're 15 pages in, now, well, you got two 25-page chunks or two 20-page chunks with a five-page midpoint in the middle that gives you uh, a clear sense of progression through that narrative. And then we go into uh, Act 3, which is... The, the same thing here, or it's act four, right? Because if this is act three here, then this is act four now. 
The same B2 and over before. They were building from the defeat and the face of the enemy for the last time. So now that we have our, our traitorous paralegal that was revealed in the midpoint, I'd imagine in the second act climax, the traitorous paralegal's nature is revealed to the protagonist. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the lawyer lost the case. Uh, hearts are broken. You know, faith has been destroyed. It's all bad. It gives you a better act two climax. So instead of just the witness, the witness now becomes a, an element of this more nefarious plan, right? So the addition of a midpoint has made the act two climax even more impactful than it was before in our previous three-act structure version of the narrative. And so act three is about rebuilding from defeat. Well, now you've got a little more story meat to play with. Because not only does the lawyer have to rebuild the case, so, so yeah, so they, they, they gave up the whole thing, they had a shouting match between, you know, uh, uh, the lawyer and the paralegal, and now the lawyer's going to go back to that small town and tell them that he can't, you know, litigate the case, but gets a spark of, of inspiration and tries to rally them around there, and maybe people that won't testify or wouldn't testify before will testify now, since they're the one witness, he has an army of witnesses, everybody from the small town, children, everybody, right? And maybe the paralegal shows up in the middle of that and says, hey, I, I, I quit. I, I gave him the money back. I, I can't do this. I can't be this. You have no reason to trust me, but I can help you here. I can prepare these witnesses for you. If you trust me, uh, I'll do it. And the lawyer trusts the paralegal, and you know they were off to the races at the trial, right? So, you know, Act Three can capitalize on all of those things that we've built in before, uh, and it's also Act Four, right? Because we had two midpoint, three, now four, uh, leading into Act Five which is the climax, or the Act 3 climax. Uh, the enemy defeated the new state of the world. So enemy defeated, we kind of know what that is, right? The dragon is slain, the trial is won, what have you. The new state of the world is, uh, the, the fancy word is the denouement, but what it really means is we need to see how the world of the story has changed because of the story, because of the, the, the events of the narrative. If everything is the same at the end of Act 3 as it was at the beginning of Act 1, then the story isn't really working because there has to be some permanent change in, in the world of our narrative. Uh, so the lawyers won the case, and maybe he was kind of a greedy guy in Act 1, right? Maybe that was the thing. Like, he wasn't a successful guy, but he was a greedy guy, a shallow guy. He was just looking for the one case that could make him rich. And at the end of the, of the story, after he wins the trial, you know, the people come in. They want to give him the book deal. They, they want to book him on the TV shows. You know, they want to hire him at the fancy law firm. But he realizes, oh, no, I don't want to do that. That's, that's not what I'm all about. You know, I'm... I, I, I want to find more people that need help, and, and I'm going to work with the, this paralegal now, and, and we're, we're dating, or you know, or at least we reconciled whatever those emotions were, and we're going we're gonna to see what we can about you know, helping the little guy against the big guy, and that's the new state of the world. I'm not greedy anymore. I'm here for justice, not for profit. Right? Um, the, the, cor the evil corporation, you know, the big fallout. Uh, maybe arrests are going to happen, you know, Gene Hackman gets fired, whatever it is. Those things have taken place, so the world is now permanently different than it was in the beginning of the story. And usually that new state of the world bit of your narrative, it's not long. You don't want to keep the audience around too long after uh, the enemy's been defeated because the conflict of your narrative has been removed at that point. And once you remove the conflict from your narrative, you have a little sand in the hourglass that you can work with to continue to tell your story, but don't overstay your welcome. You know, the, if you think it's a RoboCop, the uh, old 80s RoboCop, you know, RoboCop, you know, shoots Dick Jones and Dick Jones falls through the window. There's this puppet with like these super long arms. Um, so he falls through the window, ah, and then the old man's like, nice shooting, son, what's your name? And, and RoboCop turns around and says, Murphy, right? Because I'm, I'm no longer RoboCop, I'm Alex Murphy again, but I'm also RoboCop, but I'm really Alex Murphy. 
that's the new state of the world. It's been established. So RoboCop and Murphy have finally merged into the same, you know, character. He's reconciled that. Well, Paul Verhoeven and Ed Neumeyer, uh, the writer is Ed Neumeyer, Paul Verhoeven's the director. They're pretty smart about slapping uh, the titles on like a beat after RoboCop says Murphy because they know we don't really need to be around RoboCop anymore. Like we got it. We enjoy the experience. Let's move on to the next thing. So it's just like, you know, what's your name, son? Murphy title card. Dun, 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 dun. So you can get out super fast uh, at the end of your act three climax. You know, the, the new state of the world in star Wars is the throne room sequence, which is really like an old school musical number. You know, it's, it might as well be uh, a musical because it's just a parade and they get medals and Luke's joined the rebellion and, you know, R2-D2 and C-3PO are like super shiny. You know, Princess Leia is okay and Han Solo's smiling and they look at you and everyone's together now and, you know, dun, 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 So, like, you don't have to be there that long. You know, don't, don't tack on an extra 10 pages to your story to discuss the world state. You know, like... You, you kind of want to, you know, slay the dragon, have a little bit of a wrap up, but don't be around so long that I'm looking at my watch is waiting for this, this movie to end, you know? So that's, that's pretty much it. You know, you have three acts, act one, act two, act three. But if you split that second act into two acts, uh, with the midpoint being in the middle, The midpoint being the point of your story where the dynamic changes, where the known knowns are turned upside down. It's not your darkest point. Your darkest point is the end of the second act. Your darkest point is the result of your midpoint, right? So the midpoint turns the dynamic upside down, things fall apart, and that leads to the darkest moment in your second act. So now you have act one, act two, midpoint, act three, act four, act five. And that's how five-act structure can be kind of inserted into three-act structure. And that avoids the, the complicated forest of the second act. Uh, and that's it, man. That's story structure in a nutshell. Uh, as I said, I'm going to put a little bit of info in the notes underneath this video for further reading. Um, if you uh, have any questions... You can feel free to you know, tweet at me uh, at Brian Edward Hill, and I will answer questions as I'm able to with my schedule. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's story structure in a nutshell. So um, until next time, keep working, keep writing, take care.